How do we win? This past weekend, I was over at a buddy's house with some guys from church, and we were gathered around the bonfire, and we were talking about politics and culture. And this was the question that I asked them. How do we win? Well, that sparked this whole new thread in the conversation, and it wove its way in and out of many of the topics that we discussed that night. And one of the questions that the guys asked me in return was, what do you mean by win? Define win. And I admit that that is hard to do. I thought about what it would be like for us to end abortion in our country, to win back the public schools and the public square from left-wing ideology, and to see a massive revival of our neighbors coming to saving faith in Jesus Christ. What else would it mean to win? You tell me. But if you're distressed about the current state of things in our society and you want to know what it means to win and you want to know how you can have the biggest impact for Christ possible, then keep listening. That is what we are talking about in this episode. This is Worldview Legacy, the show that helps Christian men become the worldview leaders that their families and churches need. My name is Joel Sedecase. I am a Christian worldview teacher and former pastor who used to defend the faith the completely wrong way until God changed my attitude and my approach. Now I serve as the executive director of the Think Institute, where we help equip regular believers to become the worldview leaders that their families and churches need. I'm also the author of a new book, The Bible-Based Worldview. And speaking of books, today we have the author of the book, The Boniface Option, joining us to discuss his book and the ideas behind it and to answer the question, how do we win? You want to lead your family well and to build a legacy in the Christian worldview, a legacy that lasts for multiple generations. And you want to understand that what you do You want to lead your family well and to build a legacy in the Christian worldview that lasts for multiple generations. And you recognize that what you do in your own household ought to reverberate out and have a positive impact on the world around you. This interview is going to help you by thoroughly and powerfully diagnosing the state of the world around you and by offering a vision that I think you will find compelling for building and rebuilding a Christian culture that your family and the families of your neighbors will greatly benefit from. This is what is laid out in the Boniface Option book. To help us understand this argument, the argument of his book, Andrew Isker is joining us. Andrew Isker is a pastor and author, but I first became acquainted with him through Twitter. His handle there is at Boniface Option, and I've also enjoyed his other book, Christian nationalism. You are not going to agree with everything that Andrew Isker says in this conversation, but you are going to be able to relate to his desire to build and expand the kingdom of Jesus Christ in a way that serves Christians and non-Christians. And you're going to find many of his ideas really helpful. In this interview, here's what you should listen for. What does Andrew Isker mean by the term trash world? Why do I think that going to school board meetings and complaining is not enough? Why is it difficult to determine who is behind the leftist and anti-God movement in our society? How can we start parallel institutions and use them to take over existing institutions that have gone woke and been corrupted? And what are the benefits of being in good physical shape, even if you don't look like a Greek god? And of course, there's much, much more to listen for. Now, if you're trying to build your own knowledge base and become better able to explain what you believe based on the Bible, then I want to tell you about my new book that has just dropped. And by God's grace, it has already hit the top 100 charts on Amazon for systematic Christian theology and Christian theological anthropology. My new book is called The Bible-Based Worldview, and I'll tell you about how you can get your copy at the end of this episode. So now, without any more jibber jabber, let's jump into my conversation with Andrew Isker. 
Hello, I'm Andrew Isker. I'm the pastor of Fourth Street Evangelical Church in Waseca, Minnesota, and the author of The Boniface Option. I guess let's start with the problem. What is the cultural and societal problem that's actually facing Christianity and then specifically for our listeners, Christian men and their families? It's it's that we live in a world, I call it trash world in the book. We, we live in a world that is is almost designed to subvert and overthrow um, every part of the Christian way of life that has been enjoyed either, either explicitly or implicitly um, by Christians for uh, centuries. Um, but particularly in the last uh, several decades that it is, it's designed to lead people out of Christian faith into um, I don't even want to call it hedonistic because it's, it's, it's really not. It's much more lame than that, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> but uh, like at least, you know, the ancient Greek hedonists, you know, um, were interesting. Uh, this is – it's um, – it is just this, this sort of nihilistic, hedonistic, consumerist uh, way of life, uh, very narcissistic, where you – you, you simply exist to consume stuff and entertainment and just have fun. And that is your entire reason for being. That's your entire purpose in life is to just experience fun things and then die. And, and, and that is the thing that, that, you know, drives people out of the church, especially young people. Um, it causes, and, and not even just in, in the context of the church, but, but also society at large, it causes uh, young people to um, not pursue what would be normative uh, in really every previous generation in human history, which is to have families, to uh, build things for the future. It causes them simply to live for today and tomorrow we die. And so I'm going to collect as many Funko Pops and watch as much NFL football and, and go on as many fun little trips as I can. And that's, that's, that's why I'm alive. That's why I get up every day to go do those things. And it is, it's a profoundly depressing world. Um, when you, when you think about it in that context, but it is, it's this, you know, siren that, that sings this song that leads people to their doom. And it's in, if for, for many people, it's very attractive to live in this, in this way, in a world that is designed around providing you every want and, and thing that every, every little trinket, everything that you could possibly desire to just pursue that headlong and to abandon the world that, that God has given you. It sounds a little bit like what Jordan Peterson has talked about, uh, he he gets into the movie Pinocchio as an analogy yeah. for our society, where he talks about Pleasure Island, the yeah. island where you can have all your all your craziest fun desires met, uh, and yet ultimately mm -hmm. it turns you into an ass, into a donkey. Is that yeah? Are there? Am I hearing those echoes of Peterson? Yeah, and I, I think I yeah I probably even used that analogy once or twice in the in the book. That, you that, have, that's yeah yeah that's that's absolutely what is at play is. And it and it, it's it's so like I said, it's so lame it's so weak and and it's it's such a so small that people would would sell you know like Esau selling his birthright they sell they sell everything they've been given in order to to what uh, to be able to be child free and go to Disney World like what is what what is it all for. Um, and, and and you see this, especially you know, like our generation. You see uh, people, especially young women, who their their days of fertility are over, and they're they're getting into their forties or, or at least late thirties. And it's like, oh, the chance to have a family is gone, and now all I have are my cats. And you know, I and, and it's 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 so depressing and so sad. But that's that's what's laid before us is especially. You know, I see it like um, in college, you, know, you go to college and you kind of enjoy this pleasure island um, world. And I was in college, I, I didn't really uh, indulge in, in, in that so much. I mean, I got really involved in Christian ministry and campus ministry when I was a freshman. And but even there, it's you, you indulge in this um, kind of fantasy world where you have no responsibilities, you have limitless fun in front of you and you want to relive that high forever, right? You want to keep mm -hmm. living like you're 
21 or 22 years old into your 30s, you have this sort of delayed adolescence where I don't have any responsibilities. I can do whatever I want. I can I can put my feet up and play video games all day, or I can I can uh, watch as much TV as much Netflix as I want. I can I can go do anything I want, um, and, and people people love that, right? They think it's great. I mean, I, I I brought this up in the book that the lockdowns, the phenomenon of the lockdowns. I was I was frankly shocked by by some people. Um, there's friends that that we have from college um who you know don't have any kids and and they were they were like overjoyed when the lockdowns i don't have to go to work i could just stay at home all day and watch tv and i could have all my food delivered for me and this is like paradise it's like i hope hope the lockdowns never end and i i i'm thinking like i i was at home for like a week and going crazy because i can't Mm. i can't go see anyone i can't go do anything i can't go to church can't do anything and it's it was awful but uh, the, our world is designed in such a way where they could all but literally keep you in prison. But as long as you have some fun uh, and no responsibility, then people will accept it and like it. And, and and this has been this is something that's socially engineered. It's not it's not something that just randomly occurred through like the inexorable process of history. It is it's it's by design. They want you know I, I use the phrase the you know, internet lingo uh, the bug man. In, in the book, they want people to be the bug man. They want to be bugs that live in a hive. And um, and that's their vision for humanity is to be people that are happy to be locked away in their apartments and, and never see the sun. The title of your book is The Boniface Option, which is yeah. obviously a callback to Rod Dreher's book, The Benedict mm-hmm. Option. Yes. What is wrong with The Benedict Option as a solution to the situation that you just described? Yeah, Rod, um, to his credit, he read my book and reviewed it, left a long review, um, and he didn't like it. <laughs> he didn't like the book. But um, what is wrong with this book? I mean, really, yeah, the reason the reason I, I, I at least framed this book along those lines, I, I, I wrote about his book back in, you know, right when it came out in 2017 and, and wrote, wrote about these ideas in a small, you know, um, blog post form. And... Um, my initial read of his book was, oh, this is great. This is, yeah, intentional Christian community. That's awesome. I love that. I lived um, in Moscow, Idaho for three years and got to enjoy something like he describes in his book. Um, you know, it's a, it was a wonderful, beautiful Christian community and uh, very, very full of serious Christians that uh, uh, where their, their faith um, took a place in every, every aspect of their lives. And uh, oh, that's great. That's wonderful. But I, I read the book and I, I'm thinking, okay, well, if we all just kind of hide away in our Christian ghettos uh, and there's a thousand Moscow, Idaho's that spring up, that's, that's cool. That's great. I, I would love that. But then what, then mm-hmm. what do we do? You know, what, what happens because the regime is going to keep on rolling and it is going to destroy us at some point, you know, they will, They'll break up these communities. They'll do whatever they can. They'll they'll put people in jail. They'll do whatever they want, right? And and that's that's simply not enough. I, even, and if you think about like the historical analogy um, that that he uses, right? Okay, the Dark Ages are happening. Rome has fallen, and Saint Benedict you know begins setting up monasteries. Well, he is able to do that because there are also Christian Kings who are fighting against the barbarians, keeping them safe. Otherwise Mm -hmm. the barbarians come and they will kill and steal and rape and destroy everything. And Mm -hmm. unless you have Christian Kings that are defending them, there is no Benedict option. And so my entire thought um, with that is you need to go on offense Right. You can't just retreat, retreat, retreat. And and to his credit, I think a lot of people like misread his book thinking that it is only about retreat, but there wasn't much of a prescription for, okay, what do we do to fight back? What do we do to retake ground? And it, it really made me think, okay, I, you know, I'm, I have, I have five children and I am seeing the world. Nice. That you have five they, kids. I have kids. Yeah. And I, I see the world that they are in Praise and God. inheriting. And I'm thinking, what do I do for them? Right. How do I, how do I keep them? And I, I see so many kids, even kids that are in very conservative homeschool, you know, communities 
they grow up and they leave and they go they go wild they do the you know the jordan peterson analogy they go to pleasure island and like well how do i avoid that for my children for my family how do i avoid that outcome and at the entire time i'm thinking well i hate all this stuff i hate all of the stupid you know disney movies and i hate um, the pop culture and I hate the just desire to consume stuff for the sake of consuming it. And yeah. how do I impart that to my children to the, the same ethos? And it's, I'm like, well, I have to teach them what to hate. Uh, and like my parents, I mean, my parents didn't consciously do that with me uh, necessarily, but they're like, no, Andrew, these things are wrong. These are bad things. You shouldn't, you shouldn't like them. So in, in a sense, they did, although they wouldn't frame it that they were, that way. They wouldn't say that. I'm, I'm teaching my son what to hate. They were teaching me what I should love, what I should hate, what is what is, um, what is is good and true and beautiful, and what are the things that are the opposite of that. Um, mm. And they they you know, they caught, they know caused me to internalize those things, to, to mm. believe them deep down. And I want that for my children. And, and it has to become even more explicit today because yeah. – um, the world that exists out there is is much more deceitful, much more devious, much better at sinking its hooks into your kids, into loving these things, loving this world. And I want them to just despise it, to think, no, this is stupid. Your parents taught you what to hate. You imbibed that as you were growing up. And that's something that you're trying to pass on to your kids. And yeah. this is something that is this something that you think all Christian fathers should be doing for their kids? I think absolutely today it is. And, and it's, it's hard because like, you know, we're not, we're told, well, God is love and we should just love, love, love all day long. Love, love, love. And, um, and like, that's just, that is not a part of evangelical Christian culture at all that these are bad things that you should avoid. And, and these are things that you should uh, be abhorred by or, mm. or should you should feel just this sense of abhor abhorrence and disgust toward um we don't really do that and my you know my thing my the thing that i i am arguing is we absolutely have to we mm. absolutely have to say no these things are evil and they are after us and they are after the hearts of especially after the hearts of our children yeah and so no, you need to you need to have this um, this thumos, right? This 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 burning desire uh, that finds its way in both love and hatred. Um, that that is um, that's the thing that should drive you and should should uh, be passed on to your children. Mm. And that's how you begin to fight this world. Is is just just to start with within yourself to say no, no, this is wrong. This is bad. I. I, I am disgusted by it. I'm going to avoid it with, with everything that I have. And, um, and, and that's, that's where it begins. It's, you know, you have like Bennett adoption is well, intentional Christian communities. And it, even before you get to that point, you have to have intentional Christians. Yeah. You have to have uh, Christians who are, are self-consciously Christian in every part of their life, not just, Oh, I, we do a quiet time or we do family worship. We go to, church on Sunday, we study the Bible together and we do Christian things. It's no, every, every second of your day is Christian, mm -hmm. right? Every second of your day is, is governed by, by what God says in his world and by, by your love for God. And, um, then you, once, once you adopt that, once you begin thinking that way and living that way, then you begin looking at the world around you and seeing all of these things that are in, in total rebellion against God. And it's like, I don't like that. I don't like that thing over there either. That, oh, that's not good. Um, and, and you should be disgusted by them, right? It doesn't mean that you are just filled with rage all day and you can't do anything, but, <laughs> but burn with anger all day. Like that was right. Rod Rears, you know, like, uh, in his book or in his, uh, review of my book, he, he's like, well, this Andrew Isker, you know, he looks like he's about early thirties. I'm actually 37. So I, I glad I look young. Yeah. And, uh, he looks like he's an angry young man, angry. And, and uh, that's how he writes. You know, he used the word hate 37 times or whatever. I don't even know. I didn't even count it myself. It's like he was trying to find the, you know, secret decoder ring that spells out Ovaltine. In <laughs> right. But, um, but it, it's like, uh, no, that, that's my, my message is like, if you, if you love the things that God wants you to love, then you are going to hate everything that is opposed to mm -hmm. those things. 
right? By by j- just by its very nature, right? That's how love works. Right? If you love something, you hate its opposite, right? I, that's what I say in the book, right? God is love, which presupposes that God is also hate. Yeah, and uh, it's true. Like you read the entire Bible, and God is angry about all sorts of stuff all throughout the Bible. I just preached this last Sunday on um on Second Samuel chapter twenty four, and the very first line in that chapter is. Uh, God was angry with Israel. Hmm. <laughs> and it's like, oh, God's angry. He yeah. can be angry. Oh, but I guess I can't. According to Rod Rear, I have to be just nice and sweet and happy. But uh, no, it, it's uh, you, you should be w- in a world that is so insane, right? In a world where right, in the mainstream, the conversation is, well, you know, even like the Republican debate, they go up there and they're, they're asking the candidates. They're like, well, you know, do you think that um, it's okay for parents not to be notified if their kids are having, you know, transgender surgery? And, and of course, you know, they all answer, oh, no, there needs to be parental notification and stuff like that. And I'm thinking, like, I don't know if I was up there, I'd be like, why is this even a question? Right. Right. Why is this? Why are you even asking this? Right. Like, this needs to be eradicated from our society completely right. and not just for children. Right. This is insanity. Right. And, and <laughs> it's like. No, you should be angry about that stuff. That that's even even part of the conversation at all, or even a question at all, is well, should we should we let parents know if their if their sons, you know, genitals are being cut off? I don't really know. It's kind of it's open for debate. Unbelievable. You know, that's nuts. Yeah. That is absolutely nuts. And if you took if and and, and this is what I say in the book, right? If you go back in time and you describe our day, you know, our world, uh in in current year, uh <laughs> if you go back Yeah. Right, you go back a hundred hundred years, right? You go back to 1923, and you start talking to your great great grandparents, and you're describing the world that we live in, right? Um, all the people that say, "Oh, there's a coming dystopia, and the World Economic Forum is gonna you know put chips in us, and they're gonna do all you know this surveillance and all this other kind of stuff," you describe the world that we're living in, right? When we think, "Oh, the dystopia is coming, but it's not here yet," yeah, you describe this world. That I mean, you, even just the debate last night, mm. right? You describe that to them a hundred years ago, and they would think that something absolutely horrible has happened. We must have lost a massive war, right. and we're occupied by by insane you know, communists or something. And they wouldn't be that wrong. <laughs> and well, yeah, I know. And 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 that and that the dystopia that we fear. We're already living in it. Yeah. We're already living in Mad Max. We're already living in the Matrix. We're already living whatever, you know, dystopian movie that you want to talk about, the Hunger Games or whatever. We're living in that world already. It's already here. And so if like you don't hate it, then the problem is with you. Yeah. Right? The problem is you you aren't loving the right things enough. That's that's the issue. And and so you should be loving the things that God wants you to love. And the second that you do. Right. The, the second you start to, to love these things and love the way that God ordered the world, the way that God created the world, the God, way that God created families and the household and everything. If you start loving that stuff the way the Bible describes it, you're you're going to be disgusted by everything around you. Yeah. Right. That's that's that is what's going to happen. And and the sad thing is, even in the church, even the, the conservative Bible believing church, we don't. We don't, we, um, we've enjoyed prosperity for, you know, 60, 70, 80 years, uh, really, uh, a kind of prosperity that, that no people collectively in human history have really ever enjoyed. And because of that, we don't think about this stuff. I, I have, I have people, um, you know, friends, friends, family that, that like they read, like even a, just a portion of the book and they're like, I refuse to believe things are that bad. Your life is really good. My life is really good. Why do you think it's so bad out there? And it's like, how do you not see it? Mm. How do you, how do you, how do you like back to the debate? Like, how do you watch that? I think something hasn't got gone horribly wrong. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and cause it has, but we're, we're, we're uh, anesthetized to it because, well, my life is pretty good. I have I have a house and a car and and a good job, and I, I I things are going pretty good for me, so I don't have to worry about it too much. So, and, do yeah. you see the future as being one? Do you would you analyze the current situation that we are in in the West, what used to be known as Christendom? Would yeah. you look at it and say we are in a period of collapse, decay, and decline? And if 
left to itself right now, Western civilization is just simply going to implode in on itself. And, Mm -hmm. you know, that's a ripe opportunity for the church to build up from the ashes, so to speak. Or Mm -hmm. would you, would you see it more as, no, we're, we're not watching decline. We're watching the rise of a totalitarian globalist, as you put it, uh, trash world, uh, Mm -hmm. fake and gay complex. That is if, if we don't do anything, it's going to subsume every aspect of our life with social credit scores and 15 minute cities and apps that control our lives uh, under the penalty of death. And yeah, uh, yeah. Which, which do you see? Because in your book, you talk a lot about, well, which, which do you see that we are in right now or, or yeah. is there something else? Well, I mean, I think we're already in that world anyway. Which one? Um, the, the totalitarian world as, okay. as exists anyway I, I think we're we're already in it i mean it's not as stark as you know the the people who bring up you know uh klaus schwab and the world economic forum mm-hmm. and social credit scores and things like that but like you already you already have that um to a to a certain degree um you have um you know if you say the wrong things on the internet uh you will be depersoned you'll be totally taken off the internet. You will not be able to get a bank account anywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that it's it. Okay. Yeah. They've only done it for people like Alex Jones and people like that, but it's like, all right, if they can do it for them, what's going to stop them from doing it to anybody. There's no, there's no laws against this stuff. Right. Um, or if there are, they, they don't follow them. They mm-hmm. have no power. So it, we're already in a, a, in a world where, I mean, yeah, there already is mass surveillance. Like every, you know, every, everybody has a listening device in their pocket hmm. that they can access all day long. They have they hear every single conversation we say. So like we're in the panopticon already, hmm. um, which we don't necessarily notice it that often. The, the prison yeah. where the prison guards can literally see into everybody's cell. Yeah. 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 And, and it's like it, this, this already exists, you hmm. know, and, and can it get worse and even more totalitarian? Yes. Which way course. do you think it's, it's heading? Are we, are we are we heading towards a post apocalyptic Mad Max scenario, or are we heading towards 1984? Um, I think. Well, I think we're already largely in 1984. Okay. And they want to bring it, make it, you know, realize it more and more. Okay. Uh, for sure. Mm. Um, but the the post apocalyptic scenario. Um, I mean that's yeah, you know, it's it's something like uh you know, uh, CJ and I had talked about this actually today on on our podcast. Um. And I, I, I sort of, I go back and forth. It depends on the day when you think about, I mean, going back to the, um, you know, going back to the question of, you know, is it slow, long decline or is it uh, total collapse? Um, Is that what's occurring? Um, Is, is everything going to just implode um, all of a sudden one day? Um, It's, things are so, and this is, we we went over an older uh, Michael Anton article. Um, He's a, uh, Claremont and Hillsdale guy. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. He, uh, and that's, that's, that's his opinion too, is that I don't really, the things are so unprecedented. I mean, all of the factors that are involved in, in our political, cultural, social, economic decline, um, there is no clear historical analog for them. Right. Um, that we can, like, everyone wants to go back to the, the decline and collapse of Rome, but they had things that are dissimilar to what we have today. I mean, yeah. they had a they had, they had a ruling elite that was still scrambling to try to hold everything together, whereas ours is 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 hell bent on you know destroying the population they rule over. There, um, that's it's, the, the craziest thing. Their allegiance is not to us. No. It's not to the institutions that they've inherited. Uh, or been elected to preside over it. their allegiance is to something. Well, it's to themselves, but it's also to a, yeah. a global order that has nothing to do with the well-being of this, the citizenry. So, yeah, exactly. They, they yeah. have no, yeah, absolutely no um, loyalty to their own people, and they're they're actively. I mean, they're actively dispossessing them. They're actively uh, disenfranchising them, both you know, politically and economically. Mm. And and so, like, there's no historical analog for that because, like, there you've never had a people where. I mean, even I mean, even if you look at like the Soviet Union, um, and how 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 just destructive and violent and murderous the place was, uh, there still was you know even if they they killed millions of people, right? The killing the 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 few millions that they did, at least in their bizarre evil calculus, was to benefit the the rest of the people, right? Right? right. And and so it, even yeah. even that. 
right? Even that, or even in Mao's China, as same same kind of calculus. Even, even that doesn't exist. They are they're dead set on just destroying everybody and everything and everything that that they inherited. It's there's there's really nothing like it in the history of the world for a, a great world power, great world empire to destroy its own people like this. And so that's one on one hand, it's like, well, what happens from here because of that? I, I don't know. I don't yeah. know. Um, I, I think I mean, you see some of the the reaction to it. But the reaction to it has has largely been very subdued. Uh, it hasn't been as dramatic as as it would as you would expect. Like if, if for instance, if um, if they were doing the kinds of things uh, that they're doing today to the generation of like seventeen seventy six, or even the generation of, of nineteen forty one, <laughs> right? Can you imagine? Um, Can you imagine? No, no, I can't. I mean, they would they would just simply not tolerate it well it, it could not be tolerated at all here's I mean, the, imagine that's that's the that's the craziest thing about this is is that um the way that it's been carried out and i want to ask you about who exactly we're facing off against here andrew but the way that it's being carried out with little to no opposition is the craziest part to me because people yeah. will get outraged and and god bless these parents that go to the school board meetings i saw you went to yeah. a town council meeting and i watched your speech uh, there in Minnesota and uh, loved it. Yeah. Okay. But you yeah. see these parents and they go to these school council meetings, school board meetings. And some of these parents are so articulate and they absolutely flame the school board and it's beautiful oh, yeah. to see. But then it's yeah. like, wait a minute. What, why are you keeping your kids in that school? I know. It's like, know. Going, how? it's like, you know, you're, you're going know. down to the kidnapper's house and saying, how dare you mistreat my children? You better feed them properly and put them <laughs> and. And it's like, wait a second, take yeah. your kid away from the kidnapper. Yeah. What you is know? going on here? Why do you do this? Yeah, yeah, I know. I know we are, we are, um, we're so pacified. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I think about it too. Like if, could you imagine the COVID lockdowns being attempted with like the world war two generation? Zero chance. Not at all. No way. No, not, not one bit, but yeah. like the, this is, I mean, this is the stuff I write about in the book that, that people are atomized. They're, they're cut off from, from any you know, actual community. They're, they're yeah. deracinated from their history, their heritage. They, um, they're totally alone. And that's, it's really easy to rule the people who is alone and by themselves and feel like they have nobody on their side. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, you have these parents, but there's not a hundred parents behind them right. and all of them ready to take their kids out yeah. and threatening to do so. like, no, there, that, that doesn't exist. Everyone else is too busy, you know, watching TV. And, and so, yeah, I mean, it is, they have the people where they want them and, you know, it's, it's the adage of the, the frog in the, the pot, you know, the heat just is ever so slightly turned up and with the insanity of the last few years, they maybe turned it up a little too high, right. and some fro a few frogs jumped out, but not all of them, not even anything anywhere close to all of them. And so, I think most people do not realize, and most most people that that are you know, regular evangelical church going folks have no idea that the kind of enemy that we have that is is doing these things and the purposes behind it, why they want to do it, what motivates it. They just, I mean, I think a lot of people still think this is just normal politics as usual that it's just oh well the democrats are kind of liberal and crazy and and we just got to elect some good republicans to fight them and it's like no it's the entire system like right. the entire system is built to be this way to to destroy us and and i i think i mean even with like the trump phenomenon you have a sort of popular rising against the regime but it's no nowhere near substantial enough right there it's nowhere near enough to to really damage it and and or even uh, upend it, that that time has not come yet. Uh, I think it could. I think um, so. To, back to your you know question of like, well, long slow decline, or is this thing going to keep going for hundreds of years, mm -hmm. like a you know a, yeah a totalitarian uh, 1984 situation? And this is a point that that Anton brings up in his article. Um, I, I'll get send it to you so people can can look at it. Yeah. But um, the I, it's like I could go any way, and anybody who thinks they know for, with certainty that it's going to go this way, this way, or this way um, has no idea because we we simply do not have precedents to draw upon to give us a clear map of where things are going. 
Right. And and so, I mean, I think I tend to think, you know, if you like put a gun to my head and say, okay, you have to pick one that you think is going to happen. Um, I, I tend to think a slow collapse or a slow decline leading into a collapse is probably what is most likely to occur that, um, you, you have even, even over the last few years, since 2020, you, it initially was over, over the cover of like COVID, right? It's like, well, why does my Walmart never have everything on the shelf anymore. I, on my entire life, they've always had everything available on the shelf and it'd be like really rare if something was back ordered or whatever. Hmm. Now you go down an aisle and there's like nothing there. Hmm. Random. Like they can't, they can't maintain inventory supply. Like you can't, uh, I haven't noticed see, that by us. I've heard people talk about that stuff, but I have yeah. not. And I don't know if just the region that I'm in outside Chicago, but um, where I see some, so where I see signs of de- decline is in just sort of the social expectation that now people just loot stores. Like, Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like we're just, we're just like, this is just something that happens. Like how many targets just recently shut down as we're recording this? Yeah. Nine of them. Yeah. Nine targets shut down. Yeah. We're recording this on September 28th and nine targets nationwide are closing down. Part of that I think has to do with the conservative and Christian boycotts over their Satanistic uh, Mm -hmm. trans marketing. But what the, the reason that they give is that there's just too much theft. And yeah. we all hear that. And instead of being shocked by it, we all go, well, yeah, there's been a lot of theft and a lot of looting lately. And it's like, wait a second. Yeah. What, how yeah. How is that a thing that we're just okay with? Like, not okay with it, but we just accept that, yeah, there's it's just like, so uh, much looting that massive it's like the weather have to close. That's right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. A, a lot of looting yeah. is coming in uh, this, well, this just, weekend, you know? You know, it's like a hurricane coming through. You know, that happens sometimes. You know, they, yeah, we just we just uh, tolerate it and accept it and think that it's fine and normal. And, I mean, yeah, you see that with the looting. I mean, you see that also with – um. I mean, the big one is – I, that people really notice and it's, it's become unavoidable is like service industry. Like you go out to eat and they, you know, either are way understaffed at a restaurant. They have like one waitress working the entire place. And you, it just, you're not going to get your, your water refilled maybe once the entire dinner. And, and it, it, it isn't even just like low, like an olive garden or something. It could be like a nice expensive restaurant and the standards are just so low. Um, you know, customer service at different places is, is, is Mm -hmm. majorly in decline. I think people notice that more than anything Mm -hmm. is like, you can't get anybody to help you (laughs) anywhere. Um, and, and just like minor things like potholes, not getting filled in, in your city and, and, and things like that, like the decline in just small minor ways where it's like, it's, it's kind of like watching the, you know, the minute hand on a clock where, you know, you don't, you don't notice it move. But if you look down for and work on something for a few minutes and then you look back up at the clock, 10 minutes have gone by. Like it's, it's yeah. like that. It's, 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 yeah. it's imperceptible things. But then all of a sudden out of nowhere, like you notice, oh, oh, wow, that doesn't like and even I could give you a million examples. But it, it's, it's, it's like that where there's just it's just imperceptible in the decline in, in, the, in real time. But when you reflect back a few years, oh, I remember a few years ago, this would never have happened. Right. Um, and you sound like an old man talking about back in my day. <laughs> in my day, you know? yeah. And it's like, yeah, back in 2015, you yeah. know, we, we <laughs> stores didn't get looted. It was weird. Um, so what is the Boniface option uh, in in summary? If, if, if someone were like, okay, I've heard of this book. I've, I've heard of Andrew Isker. Um, I, I've heard of the, the Benedict option and I'm sort of familiar with it, but yeah. give us a summary of the Boniface option. And then I want to ask you a few more questions about, yeah. about, uh, how exactly it plays out in real time. So yeah, su- summarize it for us, would you? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the main difference, uh, with the Boniface option is that it is, um, it is not a defensive strategy. I mean, you look at the subtitle, it is an offensive strategy, a counteroffensive. Mm. Uh, how do we, how do we wage spiritual warfare against our enemies, against, uh, both flesh and blood ones and, and ones in the principalities and powers, right? How do we, how do we fight back against these things that are occurring? And the, the, the very first thing to do is personally, you know, look inside yourself and see, all the places, all the I- little idols to trash world that maybe, maybe you love too much, right? Things that, all right, I need to, I need to cut these things out of my life and fight and, and, and love the things that God has given me that are good. Mm. 
And, and then, you know, so just reorienting individual Christians toward what is good and true and beautiful and right. And, and, um, pointing them to, to these things and causing them to, you know, <laughs> summon the will, you know, maybe that's, maybe that's the wrong phrase to use, but to, to, to just have this burning fire to fight the things that are bad and, and, and go on the offensive, right. Mm. Whether that means, you know, being one of those parents that goes to the school board meetings or to the local town meeting or whatever, or just, or gathering people in your community together that are like-minded. And so that you have a, a tribe of people that are, that, that see the time of day and are with you. Gathering um, the, the, them together for what? A book club, a backyard barbecue, a, um, a Bible study gathering, th- just, just get together and, and just talk about the way things are. What does that look um, like in, in practice? No, I think, I mean, I think, more, more than anything in the context of the church, okay. right? Gathering them together to bring it, bring them into church and, and to do other, um, other positive things. I mean, it, it might be, it might be reading books together. It might be, um, you know, doing activities, uh, but really it, it's, um, bringing them together for a common purpose to, to build communities, build and, and to fight these evil things in their own communities. I mean, I, I live in a very small town and of 9,000 people, and we, we have this stuff. We had, we had a teacher in the high school who was non-binary and all the kids had to call her mix. And, and everyone's just like, well, I guess nothing we could do about that, you know, uh, whatever. <laughs> and, and it's like, there, there were, but there were many, many people that are angry and, yeah. and, and didn't want this occurring. There's, there's books in the public library that are, that are, you know, porn for little kids. Hmm. And it's, it, people need to be organized to, to fight those things. So some of it is just coordination issues. Like, bringing people together to fight things. Okay. Uh, bringing people together to, and, and, to also, um, you know, build, build churches. Mm. Um, I think that's, that's the, the, the biggest thing that we desperately need is, is churches that are filled with people that want to fight this stuff and are aware of the time of day and want, um, want the evil things to be confronted. Yeah. And uh, because some of it is like the ordinary mainstream, big evangelical churches, all of their pastors are trained in seminary in neutral world, and they're trained to operate within neutral world. And in neutral world, you got to be winsome, right? You got to be nice. And, and so what kind of churches or what kind of pastors do these seminaries produce? They produce pastors to be like that, that don't want to fight anything because fighting is not winsome. And, and so if you have churches that are oriented to bringing someone in that no, they want to fight what's evil and bad. Uh, that that changes things. So We're this planting is, churches to do that. I think such a misconception that being winsome. I talked with my pastor about that word uh, yeah. several months ago, and he said I have no problem. My my pastor is um, is uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't say he's he's definitely not a, a big Eva type. Um, mm-hmm. But he we were talking about winsome. He's like I have no problem with the word winsome. I think it's I think it's a fine thing. My, my issue is winsome means you want to win people over. I, I don't have a problem with that. I of course think not. That, yeah. The, the pro, because, you know, the apostle Paul, he became all things to all men so that by any means some might be saved. The problem is when winsome means you stop trying to win anything ever. Because <laughs> yeah. Yeah. winsome means you want to win. You want to win yeah. people over to your side. And you would think, you yeah. know, but, but that's, that's very different from being soft and spineless. Yeah. That's not yeah. winsome because people aren't won over to that. They, they, no. they see you as someone that they can run. You were repulsed over. by that. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, I, I look at it. Like if you, if you take the actual definition of the word, um, I feel like I'm very winsome, uh, <laughs> right. to the people that want to win. Yeah. Uh, you know, like that's, right. that's, that's where I'm at. Like I, 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 the things that I say, people are like, yeah, I agree with that. Like, yeah. and, and you're not going to get that from from most other you know neutral world pastors because they they have been trained to be doormats, mm. right? They've been trained to just nod and agree at any insanity that exists because you don't want to offend people. Right. Whatever you do, that is the eleventh commandment: you yeah. shall not offend anyone. Thou shall be nice. And yeah, and like you get rid of that, and you get people that want to actually fight. Then, then you could build things. Then yeah. you could build churches. You could build Christian schools. You could build entire Christian communities. You could build places like Moscow. And that, and that's why, like, when I think about 
you know, Moscow, Idaho. Yeah. It's not really this Benedict option community. It is a Boniface option community. I like wanted to is, ask you about that. I wanted to ask yeah. you about that. Yeah. What are some examples of the Bonif- the Boniface option being played out? And and is Moscow an example? I, I think so. Others? Yeah, I think so. I mean, no, I think there, there are several others. I mean, I, I have, you know, I have my friends, um, you know, the King's Hall guys in Ogden, Utah. Yep. They're, they are, you know, they're tempted to do the same thing there. They have a Christian school and a, yep. and a church and, and they, they want to take over their town. Right, so they, um, yeah. And that, that like even saying that, that scares the libs like, oh, they want to take over the town. Oh, my goodness. Well, that's because uh, they already but, took it over and they're worried about <laughs> yeah, exactly. losing it. Yeah, yeah, they, exactly, exactly. They already have full control. So um, if, if, if it was the shoe was on the other foot, you know, that that's the way it would be. So, yeah, I, I, I look at it that way where it's, you know, Rod Dreher actually initially was going to write about Moscow in that book. But then, you know, he got spooked by Doug Wilson and it didn't, mm. you know, and that's maybe some of the backstory of, of like his argument with my, uh, with my, uh, with my book is because like, Oh, he's an angry, angry young man, like Doug Wilson, you know? Yeah. Uh, and you were trained by Doug Wilson at the, I was. at Greyfriars, Greyfriars yes. Hall, right? Their, their yeah. pastoral seminary type program. Yes, it was. And, and so I, yeah, I got to spend three years there and it was a, uh, it was wonderful. It was a mm. great community. I mean, so much going on all the time. My wife and I, we tried to go to everything and you can't because there's so much stuff th- to do and get to do. Wow. Um, and, and it's, I mean, grown massively since we were there. It's 10 years ago now. Wow. And, uh, and, and, and they are taking over the town. I mean, they're not going to be able to fully take it over because you have a giant university there. Um, but when the universities collapse, then it's done for the libs in Moscow. <laughs> but, uh, but it, I mean, that's, that's what they've done. And I think they provided a, a, a wonderful model of, of mm. how to pursue things. And they've done it. Uh, Doug has been just the entire time. He's been there 40 years, mm. 40 plus, almost 50 years. Now. Um, and it is, it's the same pattern of just speaking boldly and truthfully and, and not ever compromising. And, and it drew people there. I mean, tons and tons of people have moved there to be part of this community. And yeah. I think you can, you could build places like that all over the, but I want to do that in my little town. Mm-hmm. You know, I want to, I want to be able to have, you know, Christian businesses here and, and, and a, a Christian school and people that, um, that are on the same page and see you know, see the same world that, that we're seeing. Yeah. I, I want that. And, and I think that that can be replicated all over the place. And, and the, the key difference is that it isn't just this place to go hide away and, and live in the catacombs away from the people trying to persecute you. It's, it's actively taking them on. I mean, you see what the guys did there during COVID, like they, they had, uh, they had the psalm sing, and they uh, they fought the city. They got arrested, and then they won the big settlement. Mm. Um, and 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 so yeah, watching watching them, you know, put their money where their mouth is is has been great. And and so many of my friends there are involved in that. And and so I I'm like that's that's the kind of stuff we should do. I mean, building communities of people that want to fight, right, for the right reasons and so- to defend what is good. Okay, so you in your book you talk about building these parallel institutions, yeah. and uh, you wrote your previous book, Christian Nationalism, with mm-hmm. Andrew Torba, who started Gab, mm-hmm. and um, okay, so Andrew Torba writes a lot about um, parallel economies, yeah, um, and in your book, I, I I heard some echoes of that. One of the things that I thought was really fascinating, though, Andrew, is that you talk about building parallel institutions and then from those institutions and this was a quick mention in your book and i was hoping you yeah i didn't i didn't elaborate on it too much yeah, yeah. from yeah. those in, from those institutions then retaking the older existing institutions so mm-hmm. is that something have you thought about how that might work and how would that work yeah i i have um i think for instance you know, when you when you get enough critical mass from an institution, when there's enough buy-in, when there are enough people, I mean, it, it might be something as simple as, you know, if you if you started a denomination, uh, it's not a great example because there's a million micro denominations out there, mm-hmm. but um, it, but if you start one and it takes off and many many churches join it, um, then eventually when it's large enough and as the other institutions decay and and die. You you take either either you um, take them over fully and completely, 
or you just you buy up the assets that they have, mm. right? If they have a university, right? You buy it and you refound your own, or or, or whatever. Um, and I mean the same thing works with, I mean not not just you know things like like churches and schools, but but also businesses. Um, that if if Christians are building businesses and building things that they can, um, you know that it grows and it does well and God blesses it, uh, then they can they can take over um, the declining. Uh, pagan ones. And so, yeah. I mean, you, you can see that, um, how, how that could work out. It, and, and so it, it might not be, I mean, there, there are people that are like, well, we, what if we all just join the PCUSA, then we could take it over. And it's like, well, it doesn't, it's not so simple because like one, you don't have enough people to be able to do that. And you don't have like institutional power to be able to do They, they would, you just get run roughshod over something mm. big like that. But I look at something like uh, like the guys. Um, there, there's a, a movement within the Southern Baptist Convention to um, to continue to make these gains uh, for conservative evangelicals in the SBC, uh, yeah. and it's growing. And so, I mean, institutional takeover looks like that too. Uh, and they're very afraid of that. The people, you know, the people in power there, they're very afraid that these dangerous Christian nationalists are going to take over the SBC and, and well, they already kicked out all the women pastors. And so what are they, what's next, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I, I think things, things like that it, it can, can occur and can happen. You can, I mean, the SBC is a great example because it was until like the nineties, it was essentially a liberal denomination mm-hmm. and they took it back. And, and so, I, I think examples like that where where there's some places it's possible to do that. Um, in, in other places, you just have to build your own and replace what exists. The SBC is such a great example and such a counterintuitive one because mm-hmm. when when Al Mohler came to Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in was it ninety two or ninety three somewhere around I think there. So yeah, yeah, it was it was a very it was a feminist institution. They were mm-hmm. they were training lady pastors, and he came in right when the neutral world was was kicking off and reaching its height and he came yeah. in with a combative stance but yes but Moeller is he's i would dare say he's a pretty winsome guy i mean he oh he's, yeah he's not a you know he's not like a a, a spittle flecked uh raving lunatic uh no. scrawling on the wall or however doug wilson no. might, might, yeah 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 use those, those <laughs> i was gonna say you're using doug words there yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, he's he's um you know he's he's very intelligent he's got oh, a yeah? certain uh what, what's uh he's got a certain um uh churchillian gravitas. Yeah, yeah and gravitas yeah. yes yeah and so right when when neutral world was was surrendering all these institutions moeller was taking back moeller and the other conservatives were taking it back so that's yeah very hopeful that's a really good example oh yeah yeah um, and it's i think it's actually easier now in some instances because um the the left and you have these like crypto woke people in basically every uh conservative christian denomination they're trying to push it leftward sure. and they they're always very slick operators where they know exactly what they can say and how to wrap their rhetoric in oh, yeah. very very Christian sounding stuff. It sounds very biblical and um, they're able to move the dial effectively mm-hmm. over the last 10, 20 years. But now things have gotten so insane and people are, Oh, you know, the kind of the squishy middle that, that gets, that gets roped into stuff very easily. That's not super aware and not, they're not thinking about this stuff all day. The pastors and the leaders that think that, that, that are just kind of there in the middle, the moderates, yeah. right. They would easily get the wool pulled over their eyes decades ago. But now they're aware of wokeness mm. and their radar is up. Their shields are up. They're like, uh, I don't know. That sounds kind of woke. That's a good point. And, That's uh, a good point. And so it's easier for the conservatives to raise the alarm and for them to actually hear it where you don't sound like the boy crying wolf. It's like, no, these are, these are bad people that need to do us harm. We need to fight them. We need to strengthen, you know, these churches. And, and yeah. so I, I think, um, we're poised to make a lot of gains. Um, I mean, it's still bleak. <laughs> things are, things don't look great at, at this hour, but the potential for uh, consolidating gains in, in conservative denominations is, is there uh, because people are, people are much more aware now of the, the playbook that's being run on them. I love that. You talk about okay the playbook that's being run on us. You talk about how our society. Uh, I, I watched your interview <coughs> on um, 
with Joel Webin uh, mm -hmm. of Right Response Ministries. I watched uh, part of that. And you were talking about how the society that we live in now and this current state that we're in is not accidental. I think you mentioned it yeah. earlier when you were talking with me. This yeah. is not accidental. Yeah. It's not just the irrevocable flow of history. This is yeah. all by design. So I want to ask you a challenging, possibly controversial question, but I don't think <laughs> I don't think you shy away from those. No, um, no. When we're talking about from from a human perspective, not a spiritual perspective, Ephesians yeah. six, we wage we wage war against Satan and his minions. From a human perspective, who is designing and driving what you call trash world? Who yeah. is, who is that, and how do we oppose them? Yeah, I mean, I think um, you know it's a difficult question because it is. I mean, I don't know if you're familiar with like uh, Moldbug, Mencius Moldbug, Curtis Yarvin, uh, no. but his and his theories. You know, he uh, he ta he would talk about this thing called the cathedral. And it's this decentralized conspiracy theory where it isn't, it isn't just like one person that's pulling all the strings. It's not like George Soros there. He's got the right. puppets and everything. Um, it's like you remove a node and it still keeps on chugging. Like, yes. it'll, yeah, like that, that is, I, I think apt. I think that, is a good summary of it where it isn't just like, Oh, here, if we just take care of these couple people, then it's all over and we win. Um, it is, it's self-reinforcing. It is, it's it certainly there, there's an elite class that, that rules the country and is, is wrapped up in, in, in these things. But um, so like, say, so you look at it, like you look at all the billionaires that, that, that operate in, in the country, you look at all the people in, in government that have a tremendous amount of power, mm -hmm. right? If, if today, um, right. If I got to sit down with, with Joe Biden, right. And, uh, and Love he was, and he was cogent, right. He was able to like have the mental acuity to listen to what I have to say and be persuaded by it and say, I did, did persuade him. And now, now he thinks exactly like I do on every conceivable issue. Right. right, and he's right. the president of the United States. Yeah, um, what would happen? Not right. Much. Well, exactly. <laughs> yeah, like they would just literally do everything they did to Trump to right. him. Totally. And and um, nothing would change. the The system would continue to. I mean, it would, it'd be a little bumpy because he, you know, there's some things you could do even with the nominal power of the presidency. Right. But it, very little would change. Hmm. Right. Very 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 little would change. Or if I the same thing, if I did the same thing with like Mark Zuckerberg, right? I just sit down with Mark Zuckerberg when you're one of the richest men on the planet mm -hmm. uh, and, and controls, you know, two of the biggest social networks there, there are. And I'm able to sit down and persuade him of every single thing. I, I think he becomes a Christian and, mm -hmm. and all of this, right? What would happen? Right. Well, they would do to Facebook and to Instagram, what they did to Gab and Andrew Torba. Right. They would shut it down. They would do every like they would demonetize it. They would take away all the I mean, what they're also doing to to a certain extent to, to Musk. Right. They would they would do everything they could to shut them down. Right. They would excise that node from from the operating system. Right. The operating system would keep going. Yeah. And um, and so when I when I talk about, you know, them or the elites or the ruler, it's like that's that's kind of how I have to frame it is it's a really murky thing. Like it's, it's hard to, you can't just pin it on this guy or that guy. And if we take care of these people and get them out of power, well, it's, it's so entrenched and there is, I mean, it's like, you know, it's like a football team, you know, uh, and they always have a next man up, right. To fill this, to fill this role. Like there's a, there's a next man up that's ready to go. Yes. But a football team has a ready. coach. They have, they have. Yeah, managers. I know. And it's, the analogy is, <laughs> The analogy is not perfect, um, but uh, you, you know what I mean. Like, there's always a next. I do, game. yeah. And if yeah, if the coach got sick, right, the the assistant coach would take over. You know what I mean? Like, it would. Yeah. There's always yeah, yeah that's to true. Fill, to, that's true. To fill these roles, and that's true. Um, or if they fire the coach, there's an interim coach. Like, that's that, true. That, yeah, yeah. That You're is right. even the coach is dispensable to a certain degree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every and even the owner. Like you see this with the mm -hmm. Redskins, they get rid of Daniel Snyder. You know, it's like they'll they'll find an owner for the team. You know, somebody yeah. will pay a billion dollars for an NFL team. So it's it is it's like that where it it it's this self running system, and mm. it's almost it's 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 difficult to pin down. 
where it's like, oh, these are the people that are in charge or those are the people that are. Well, no, it's it's a conglomerate. There's yeah. all all sorts of different interests. And of course, there's personal self-interest. I mean, Joe Biden gets his money from China or whatever. <laughs> like, right. like they, all, they, 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 they milk the system, too. Like they, uh, they get something out of it. Just a disclaimer, the Think Institute is not a political organization. <laughs> and I don't uh, approve or that's, disapprove that's of any of the statements right. that are made on this. Side. <laughs> that's right. That, yes. Yes. <laughs> so is my, my church is a 501c3. Yes. So I <laughs> right, get. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, that, yeah. That's, I don't speak for the, the church. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you know what I mean, though? Like it, it is um, the, the system could, could be self-interested and but still continue operating. And if you go outside of it, right, they will cut you out and it'll keep on going. And so it's it's way, um, way, way, way harder to um, to to say, OK, well. It's this guy. It's just George Soros, or it's just Klaus Schwab, or totally. it's, just, it's it's whatever. And so I, I don't even I don't even necessarily like to go down those roads. I like to keep it vague because it is vague, right? Yeah. It is vague. who exactly rules over us? Well, there are elites, right? Yeah. Uh, but right. can we pin them all down? No. Um, no. It's it is um, it's it's much more complex and convoluted than I think anybody can really fathom. Mm-hmm. At the same time, they have political power and cultural power and 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 all of this, but there is an end to it. I mean, it's like um, one of the things that I talk about uh, regularly is like the Soviet union. uh, Mm -hmm. And that's much more formal, clear power structure. Yeah. But the Soviet union, right. It existed. And in in the eighties, I mean, you have like Harvard economists saying, Oh, the Soviet union is going to be around for a thousand years. Mm -hmm. And, and they, every, especially liberal in America thought, Oh, it's, it's here to stay. Yeah. And then one day it's gone. They just, Mm -hmm dissolves. And, and so there is a, a popular mandate to rule that like our own elites have, right. They currently possess, but at a certain point, and it might have to be really bad because the propaganda regime that they have is, is, is very finely tuned and they're able to manipulate and control people. But even then, even despite this, there's a certain point at which people say, I'm not going to listen anymore. I'm done with them. And then the mandate to rule is gone disappears and so, and so when you talk about like collapse and decline and things like that that's 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 what that sounds like to me. Yeah. yeah okay so so man we've got to bring this back then to ephesians 6 because yeah um as much as and I, I i feel good going here now andrew because as much as people might like to say look it's it's pointless to try and fight these battles from a human institutional level because ultimately we're waging war against satan and it's like yes that's true but satan doesn't just operate out in the ether i mean satan his whole playbook ever since the tower of babel has been to convince and collude with people in power who then manipulate the institutions to keep people oppressed and keep them from god ultimately but when you Mm -hmm. go to ephesians 6 it does say it says finally be strong in the lord and in the power of his might put on the whole armor of god so uh, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. And this is where he says, and this is not an escapist verse here, but in verse no. 12, he goes, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. And he, then he doesn't just say, therefore don't wrestle. Yeah. He says, yeah. you know, <laughs> be winsome. But he says, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, over this present darkness. So it was going on then mm-hmm. too, against mm-hmm. the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And then he says, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. And um, mm-hmm. I, I just, I want to encourage our listener here too. And maybe, maybe um, our listener is feeling frustrated and maybe a little bit exasperated on where to start. Uh, J.R.R. Tolkien has this great depiction of evil he the way he describes evil sometimes you can win sometimes you fight and you overcome evil sometimes the way that you have victory is simply to stand in the face of evil sometimes that's yeah. enough where it's like yeah. okay maybe my kids are going to be the ones to finally overthrow this maybe my grandkids but for me in this mm-hmm. moment i'm not going to do the thing that they want me to do you know it's mm-hmm. it's the meme i will not live in the pod i will not eat the bugs <laughs> that's right you know yeah um yeah ma- ma- totally Maybe that's just the first step, and maybe that maybe that even jives with what you were saying earlier. Like you have to begin to hate what God hates in your heart first, and it's mm-hmm. just like I'm just not going to do these things. I'm just not going to comply, and yeah. and I'm going to put on the armor of God, come what may, and then anything beyond that, we're we're already winning because now we're setting yeah. ourselves up for our kids to win, our grandkids to win. What do you think yeah. about that? 
No, absolutely. And that's, I mean, and, and, and that's just, it is the, oh man, like the, the first step is, is you saying no, mm. right? Just standing up saying, no, we will not do this. Like, yeah. The meme, right? I will not live in the pod and eat the bugs. Right? I, I no, I'm not doing this. Yeah. And, um, and then other people can come alongside you and do the same. And you begin to fight for a world that, yeah, maybe you're not going to get to enjoy it, mm -hmm. right? You might not get to enjoy peace and prosperity and, and good things in your lifetime. And again, yeah, your kids might not either. Maybe their kids do. And so you, yeah. you begin to have a long-term perspective on, on why you do these things, why you fight for these things, because it isn't about you. It's about right. your duty to your children and your children's children and to your, your community and your nation around you that you – you do all of that because you love them and you want the best for them. That's like, a, that's, like the Chesterton that's why you fight. quote. Chesterton says the true soldier fights not because he hates what is in front of him, but because he loves what is behind him. Yeah, and and yeah, that's 100%. why that's why we fight. Uh, can you um, can you give us some practical steps for the Christian man who's listening to this? He's a regular believer, not going to go to mm -hmm. seminary, probably not going to go to Gray Grayfriars, Grayfriars Hall. Hall. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, but is motivated, wants to take some practical action steps in his life. What do those action steps look like to start pursuing the Boniface option? Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I laid out several uh, in the book. Mm -hmm. I mean, one is, is if you're not part of a church, to be part of one, to find a good church, to find a church that is is serious about worship. It's not just entertainment, but it's mm -hmm. actually the people of God worshiping together. Um, uh, secondly, uh, to begin to you know, reorient your life. If you have a family to, to structure it around, you know, actually having a household rather than just, uh, you know, two parents that are econ you know, economic unit one, economic unit two and, right. and offspring, uh, yeah. but rather to, to structure your life around having a household um, to just for, for you personally. Uh, I think a, a big one is like, why, why are men, why, why don't men want to fight? Why don't men want to stand up for what's good? And right? Well, um, we have, we have um, become, you know, fat and weak, uh, literally like our, our body. We are not, uh, we don't, the average, um, the average man today, the average like 22 year old has the same testosterone level as a, as a 70 year old man from 40 years ago. And so it's like, that is, that's nuts, yeah. right? That is, that is crazy. Um, and the, the big reason why is that um, excess lipidity lowers testosterone. Like if you are obese, you are not going to uh, be as masculine. Mm. And, and it's like, oh, and I, even that, like, that's kind of by design. Like they want us to be this way. So, mm. I mean, one way to, to fight trash world is to get in good physical shape. I mean, you don't even, you don't have to have like the body of a Greek God, but even just losing 30 or 40 pounds um, drastically changes you like lifting weights and, and getting in shape is, is a huge, is it just from a mental uh, and physiological standpoint, yeah. it, it changes your entire persona. Yeah. Uh, I was, um, you know, for, for many years I was, I was big, you know, I, I, I topped out over 310 at one point. And, um, I can tell you for a fact that I don't feel emotionally and physically the, and mentally the same that I did then as I, as I do now, it, mm, it changes, really? it drastically, drastically changes you. And, uh, I mean, I, I, my wife could say the same thing, like you're, you're much more assertive now. I don't know if this is, I don't know if I, I like, uh, <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if I like you strong, uh, but, uh, no, it, it's, uh, it is. It, it, it's true. I mean, it, it, it changes what you're like. We're not Gnostics. Yeah, right? We believe right. in the material world that God has made, that, that we are a, a incarnational people, that mm -hmm. Jesus took on human flesh and that we live in a, a real world. And, and so it has an effect on you. There's a spiritual effect on, on your physical health. So that's, I mean, that's mm -hmm. a, that's a huge one, like a tremendously huge one that I think is often neglected. So you get people that are good physical shape and then like you talk about like summoning the will to fight these things much easier when, when you know that you can uh, physically exert your will on the world by picking up heavy things. Um, yeah. it's, it's not to be understated. And, um, 
it's a great you know, beyond point. that um you know it's funny like you begin to you begin to get in shape and you start to hate like tv more <laughs> like you start to hate like just sitting and vegging out like it's right. like yeah I, I don't like this so it's a lot easier once you do that it's a lot easier to just to hate a uh, trash world i mean some of it is it's funny like cutting out entertainment and things like that um there was this writer's strike and apparently yeah i guess they just ended it but uh, oh, apparently, did they? like yeah no movies no movies and tv shows and things are coming out and i'm thinking to my wife i'm like other than like dune being delayed this doesn't really affect me at all. Mm. <laughs> Even like a little bit. It's Seriously. like, yeah, there's like not anything that uh, I actually, like, I don't, I see the previews for movies and I'm like, well, that looks stupid. That looks yeah. dumb. I don't care about that. Why, who would want to go see that? <laughs> and, and it's like, I, I have zero. I used to love to go to movies. I love movies. And now it's like, well, I guess I'm just going to, you know, go watch bridge of the river Kwai uh, uh-huh. again for the 15th time, you know, like that's, that's it. Like say the only entertainment that's, that's valuable has already been made. I mean, yeah. I, I have friends that say this about like video games too. It's like all the good games already got made. The rest of them are going to be about, you know, uh, who, whatever woke thing. And right. so like, yeah. that's over, that's over. Yeah. Just go back and, and, and play counter-strike. Uh, like <laughs> things like that's what they say. And it's true. Like all the entertainment that you're hoping for that's like, Oh, someday we're going to get good based entertainment. Like, that's not coming. Yeah. Uh, not for a long time. Right. And so just get rid of it. Like your life will be better, not glued to a TV screen all mm. day long. Um, so like cutting those things out and it, you'd be surprised at how, how much it changes you and how much more free time you have to do things. It's like, Oh, I could go for a walk for an hour right now. I don't totally. have to sit and watch Hulu now. Uh, yeah. And if you think about it, like have to, right? Like, uh, Oh, I have to watch this show. Like I don't have to do that anymore. Mm-hmm. I don't care about it. Um, yeah. And then it takes you out of, it takes you out of this world and it's like, okay, well, you're not going to be able to have conversation with your coworkers about whatever stupid streaming show. And it's when I've worked at, you know, you know, office jobs before, like that's all people talk about. It's like, what well, did you stream this show? We binge watched it last week. And it's like, no, I don't really watch TV. Uh, I read a book this week. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, uh, uh, you, you want to hear about that? Uh, yeah. no. Okay. Uh, like that's, that's the, the, the world that we're in. And so if you can like get out of that world and begin mm. living in the world that used to exist, um, in, in more and more facets, that just makes you a, a living embodiment of, you know, Boniface cutting down these, these idols, right? Because you're saying, no, no, I don't want that. I don't want this world that you've crafted for me. Mm. I prefer to live in a different world. I prefer to live in a different, in a world that is in many ways, much more difficult, much harder world world to live in, but a world that's so much better. Yeah. So much better. So join a good church, begin to reorient your life and structure your family as a household. Stop being fat and weak. Grow your testosterone by getting in <laughs> uh, good physical shape and get rid of trash TV and entertainment. Man, those are great places yeah. to start. There's a whole world out there. And uh, TV is, um, yeah, it's a silly thing to orient your life around. That's for sure. But so everybody does. Yeah. It's crazy. I don't, I don't ever turn the TV on. I have no idea. Yeah. And, and it's like, well, I guess, you know, maybe my analogies on Sunday morning aren't going to hit as strong if I, if I reference, you know, 40 year old TV shows, right, or something. Right. but, uh, but it's like, I don't care. What is your next book going to be about? Oh, and there's, there's several that are kind of bouncing around in my yeah. noggin. Um, I mean, I have, uh, I've been, I pre, I just finished preaching through, uh, first and second Samuel. So I, I, I kind of thinking like, Oh, do I put together a devotional series on that and, and oh. use some of, some of the stuff I've already done? That's, that's one that I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to, to, you know, finish, uh, somewhat soon. And, uh, I'm, I'm also, um, you know, I'm, I'm working on, you know, possibly a, a book about, you know, just an optimistic Christian future. Hmm. Um, that, that might be one, uh, possibly, um, a follow up to, the, the one I did with Torba on Christian nationalism. Cool. Um, and, and also, you know, uh, on the, uh, so that's the white pill side of it. The white, the black pill is I would, I, you know, writing about the, you know, st- some of the stuff we talked about today, hmm. um, just decline or collapse or permanent totalitarianism. Like what does the future hold? Where, where, where do things go from here? And, and especially, you know, geared toward Christian leaders, 
how do you prepare yourself and your people for what is to come? Because there is, there is a tremendous amount of opportunity. I think, like you said, um, that the, the, the men who are bold and, and courageous in the coming years, I think God is going to, uh, God is going to bless them greatly. Where can we find your book? And then how do we listen to your podcast? What's it called? So you can find the book at boniface or just search for it on, on Amazon. Um, and yeah, the podcast, Contramundum. And you know, normally we talk about you know history, politics, culture, uh, theology, uh, kind of whatever, wherever, wherever things take us. Fantastic. All right, man. Well, it's been great talking with you and uh, look forward to our next conversation. Thank you, brother. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. So now you know. What does Andrew Isker mean by the term trash world? He's talking about the world that seems designed to subvert and overthrow all of the biblical Christian values that we hold dear and that we want to guide our family and that we want to inculcate in the younger generation. Why do I think going to school board meetings is not enough? Because going to school board meetings can be good and powerful, but for now, with the current state of things, A stronger statement would be made by taking your kids out of the public school, and that would also help to better protect your children against the trash world ideologies that so fill so much of public education. That doesn't mean that Christian teachers should get out of the public schools. I think we need more Christian teachers in public schools, but if you're a Christian parent, you have to really think hard about whether or not that's the best place for your kids. Why is it so hard to determine who is behind the leftist, woke, anti-God movement in our society? It's because there is no one guy at the top. And if the leadership were to be replaced, someone else would simply step in. Remember the football team analogy that Andrew Isker used. So it's the whole world and the view of the world that we have to wrestle against. I think that's why why Andrew Isker calls it trash world. How do we start parallel institutions then and use them to take over the existing institutions that have become corrupt? We do so as believers rooted in the Bible-based worldview, and we launch, build, and grow healthy institutions. And then as the unhealthy institutions of the world wither, we will then be in a position to take them back over or simply let them die and replace them with healthy Bible-based institutions. And then finally, we talked about the benefits of being in good physical shape, even if you don't look like a Greek god. But uh, why is that? Why is it beneficial? Because getting in shape can change your whole persona. It changes what you value and can even help ground you in reality. There is something very beneficial in getting in shape. And this is something that I've been thinking a lot about lately as I've rejoined a gym. So we talked about the benefits of getting in shape, even if you don't look like a Greek god. Getting in shape can help change your whole persona and your outlook. It changes what you value and can even help ground you in reality. This is something I've been thinking about a lot as I've rejoined the gym. Now, if you are a Christian seeking to deepen your faith and effectively share it with others, I want to tell you about my new book. In it, you will get to do a deep dive into the importance of worldviews and the alarming fact that only 4% of Americans hold a biblical worldview. As a Christian man, you can be a beacon of truth in a world that is increasingly detached from biblical principles, as Andrew Isker would call it, trash world. The book offers a clear explanation of what a worldview is and why it matters insights into the seven fundamental questions that every worldview must address, a comparison of the Bible's answers to these questions with other worldviews, and practical guidance for understanding and defending the Christian faith. You'll also get a comprehensive exploration of the Christian worldview's answers to the seven key big questions of life. Now, if you would like to empower yourself to articulate Christian beliefs with more confidence and to engage in more meaningful discussions with non-Christians and to fulfill your role as a spiritual leader within your family and your neighborhood and your community, this book can help. You will not only strengthen your faith, but also draw nearer and closer to Jesus, the source and perfecter 
of our faith, according to Hebrews 12 too. The book is called The Bible-Based Worldview, and it will be a valuable resource for Christian men like you who want to make a difference in the world that is in so desperate need of biblical truth. Well, thank you for listening to Worldview Legacy. Special thanks to our guest, Andrew Isker, for joining us. Be sure to get his book, The Boniface Option, at Amazon, and to check out his podcast, Contra Mundo. This show is produced by yours truly, Joel Sedecase, and it is a production of the, the Think Institute. We are a Christian teaching and outreach nonprofit completely funded by like-minded people like yourself. And you can learn more and consider supporting this cause at thethink.institute slash partner. From all of us at the Think Institute, stay based by God's grace.